Okay. So it's, a, it's very important to point out that um, there are certain individuals that you come across uh, throughout your life who are real, who base their activities on a certain element of integrity. And Muhammad Ali was one of them. Uh, he was a very special and unique individual. And when I went to see him at Deer Lake, Pennsylvania, at his training camp, and I spent several hours with him, um, he, his, his, his capacity for determining whether or not somebody was telling the truth, whether or not somebody was real, whether or not um, somebody was credible, uh, was very simple. It was what he felt um, in, re in response to how you expressed yourself. If you let him know that you um, felt the same about brotherhood, about humanity, as he did, um, if you let him know that you were speaking from the heart, from your soul, um, he was completely receptive and he instantly became my best friend. That's just the kind of man he was. He was real. It didn't take him very long to determine whether or not I was telling the truth. It took him just a matter of a couple of minutes, as a matter of fact. So when you're trying to determine whether somebody's crazy or somebody's real or somebody's um, trying to trick you, you have to feel it. And you have to feel their, um, that identification uh, as a human being. And Muhammad Ali was one that was perfectly capable of doing that. It has nothing to do with the amount of education you have. It has nothing to do with uh, reason or a rationale or uh, a list of uh, analyses. It simply has to do with uh, feeling. So what I want to discuss today is um, the differential between Muhammad Ali, a person like Muhammad Ali, and others that I met, um, predominantly as a scientist today. Uh, I'll talk about my music career another day. But the, um, in 1979, after I made the discovery and I uh, examined the data and realized that I was right, that the calculations were spot on with reference to data that had already been produced and published in peer-reviewed journals, I noticed uh, that the first few years post-discovery was difficult. They were difficult because there was the credibility factor and scientists don't have that capacity to understand whether somebody's telling the truth or not because they're always trying to analyze everything and reason their way into or out of a position. For example, uh, when I sent a paper for the first time to the uh, Journal of the National Cancer Institute, the uh, associate editor-in-chief called me and she said, uh, I think your paper is too philosophical, but she was uh, certainly curious because she couldn't know whether it was right or wrong. And her illusion was, was that the references 
were handled in a little bit different way than she was accustomed to. There were some references that, you know, were based in science and nature and, you know, professional journals. And there were some references that were based in simple, simple books on technology and so on and uh, electromagnetism. And she tried to question everything. And I explained to her, um, the issue is not whether, not, not whether I expressed um, the information properly or customarily, but whether or not I was right. And I told her, I'm right. There's no question about it. Why should I be the only one to cry for the children? And she said, you're not the only one who cries for the children. And I said, yes, I am. Because I'm the only one who knows that there's something else that's not being done for them. And they're suffering and dying. And she said, well, send the paper back to me. I sent it back. And then I waited another six months. And then I called her. And I said, well, what's your decision? And she said, it looks the same to me. And I said, it is the same. I didn't change it. It happens to be correct. And then she said, well, I think you should send it to the Journal of Theoretical Biology. So I said, all right. I didn't want to. I wanted her to publish it. But I agreed to take it back and send it to the Journal of Theoretical Biology, which was published by Academic Press. It was a very good journal um, coming out of Great Britain. So I sent the paper to the Journal of Theoretical Biology, and they rejected it. And I said, this is absurd. Um, more than a year had passed, and I was just wasting time. And someone died from cancer every minute. So I said to myself, uh, because of my experience as a musician, I'm just going to send this uh, around the world. And I'm going to see whether or not I can uh, hone this experience outside of the United States and then eventually bring it back. So I sent the same paper to the Israel Medical Journal, the Italian Medical Association Journal, and the British Medical Association Journal at the same time. And you're not supposed to do that, but I didn't care. Uh, Israel sent me a very strongly apologetic rejection. Uh, Great Britain sent me a very courteous rejection. And Italy accepted it. They just wanted me to shorten it. And they accepted it. So I found my publisher, the Italian Medical Association. There was somebody there who understood me. His name was Franco Bistolfi. He was a radiation oncologist, the premier radiation oncologist in uh, all of Italy, probably all of Europe. He was a brilliant scientist and open-minded. And I published probably um, two dozen papers in the years that followed with the Italian Medical Association. And ironically, uh, I just should mention in passing that I did publish with the Journal of Theoretical Biology, but it took me an extra five years before they accepted the paper, another paper, but they accepted a paper. But it took Professor William Yamanashi, who was a physicist from MIT, who taught physical chemistry at Harvard, did research at Johns Hopkins and MD Anderson. Um, he did hyperthermia research at MD Anderson in cancer. And he was the head of uh, MRI research at Oral Roberts University. <clears throat> which is uh, what he was doing when I met him. And then he 
moved on to uh, University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center. But it, my point is it took Professor William Yamanashi to call the chief editor of the Journal of Theoretical Biology to let him know that he should publish my paper because it was a very important paper. And finally, he published it. But it was published in, I think it was 1991. And I made my discovery in, in 1979. So we're looking at 11 years, 12 years, well, 11 years by the time they accepted it, 12 years by the time it was in print from the point of discovery. How many people suffered and died for absolutely no reason? But that's not my point today. In 1986, I met uh, Professor Reba Goodman from Columbia and others. I went to um, an international conference on bioelectromagnetics in New Hampshire at the college there. And I met, um, there were about a hundred scientists there. And it was basically sponsored by the uh, United States government. And uh, Professor Abe Liboff was there lecturing. As a matter of fact, I raised the issue about picotesla magnetic fields um, somewhat into his lecture. And he gave me short shrift. Also, also Arthur Pillar was there lecturing. And I did the same with Arthur Pillar. He was at Mount Sinai. And he gave me short shrift. But the fact of the matter is that the young scientists there all surrounded me, eager to hear what I was saying. It was like I was Socrates uh, teaching the youth. And the older professors were still in earshot, still curious about what I was saying. But they wouldn't admit it because their egos were anything less uh, than honest. What I saw was the lack of integrity. Uh, what I saw was a paucity of intelligence, unfortunately. At any rate, um, Reba introduced me to Bjorn Nordenstrom's work. Bjorn Nordenstrom was the outgoing president of the Nobel Assembly in Medicine and Physiology. Of course, he, were, he was also the chairman of diagnostic radiology at the Karolinska Institute, the home of the Nobel Assembly. Bjorn had written a book called Biologically Closed Electric Circuits. And at that time, we exchanged material. He sent me a copy of his book. I sent him a copy of my publication. He invited me to Sweden. Uh, I went the beginning of November 1986. And when I went to the airport, um, the plane had been overbooked. This was in uh, LaGuardia. And I was told that I couldn't get on the plane. And we waited hours and hours. And I complained. I had to get on that plane to go teach the Nobel Assembly about my discovery. And I wound up getting on the plane. They let me on the plane. And I was sitting next to a window and, and in the aisle seat, there was a woman and there was a small crib hanging from the top with a little baby in it. And I had no place to put a suitcase. It was under my feet and I was cramped all the way from New York to Stockholm. But it was a sacrifice that I was willing to make because 
I had to go talk to the Nobel Assembly to see what their reaction would be. And of course, it's six hours later in Stockholm. Um, and this was in 1986. So I was living in Florida, I had to fly to New York first. And from New York, I had to go to Sweden. Well, it was nine o'clock in the morning in Sweden, but it was three o'clock in the morning, uh, my time. And I told the person next to me, it's a good thing that I can speak about this in my sleep. I was exhausted. I had recently had eye surgery for glaucoma, but I was determined. And Bjorn Nordenstrom was the uh, lecturer. It was his conference, actually, an electrobiology conference. And I found him to be quite brilliant. After all, he was the one who discovered balloon catheterization, needle biopsy, and an electrochemical treatment for cancer, in which a needle is placed into a tumor that's accessible and electrical current is passed through the needle into the tumor. The acidification of the tumor occurs, destroying the tumor, but there are also electromagnetic interactions at the periphery of the tumor, which is very important. And Bjorn uh, let me know, let everybody know that the results of his electrochemical treatment for cancer were actually better than everything combined in the West. But the West didn't accept Bjorn's discovery of the cancer treatment. Instead, it was China that paid attention to Bjorn's uh, electrochemical treatment of cancer. At any rate, the conference went on at the Karolinska Institute. I introduced my equation mc squared equals bvlq i discussed the importance of pico tesla range magnetic fields i made it clear that um, that bjorn's technique would work better if he reduced the current and he was a little irritated because he said they don't understand his technique to begin with and i'm improving it there so it was as though Bjorn was the only one who really, um, you know, trying, he was trying to relate a message to his peers. Well, the fact of the matter is uh, at, uh, at the Medical Association dinner in Stockholm the following day, the incoming president of the Nobel Assembly came over to me and he posed a question. He said, could a column of water uh, be held in suspension with a magnetic field? And I said, well, we're mostly made of water. And he said, no, 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 just water, just water. And I thought, and I said, well, um, yes. And then I suggested various interactions that could make that possible. And when I said magnetic monopole, um, he didn't quite get it, but magnetic vector potential gave it to him. And he said, ah, I know what that is. And what happened was he made a toast at the dinner and he said we didn't know this would happen but we we have considered this to be an historic event because we never heard the name einstein mentioned in biology before and then everybody turned around and shook my hand and congratulated me and then they made their toast and i felt 
well, maybe, maybe I got through. But then I went home. Nothing changed. Absolutely nothing. Nobody lifted a finger. There was a physiologist at that conference who said to me, um, does so-and-so believe you? I don't remember the guy's name. That was a well-known physiologist. And I said, I don't know. Maybe not. And when I said, maybe not, that was his answer. Well, if that guy doesn't believe me or might not believe me, then I had to be wrong. In other words, the Swedes follow the example of the Americans. They don't think for themselves. Who does? Nobody does. They don't think for themselves. But there was a Polish scientist there who believed me, who came to me, and who asked me all kinds of questions. He believed me. He understood it. He got it. So there weren't many who got it. There were a few. But nothing changed. Because in order to make a change, you have to change the economics and the politics. The science comes last. Reality comes last, truth comes last, integrity comes last. And that is the result of corruption. Corruption of the spirit, corruption of intent. I mean, think about this. When doctors take the Hippocratic Oath, they pledge to do no harm. But when you listen to commercials about drugs on television, all they do is list a number of very serious deleterious side effects. That is not doing no harm. And the FDA lets these drugs pass. Why? Because they, they hit their primary outcome measure based upon, you know, funding of a study that's executed according to the dictates of uh, the FDA. But that doesn't mean it's appropriate. And letting a drug go for 10, 20 years, and it winds up killing hundreds of people because it's dangerous. And who knows how many people it hurts. Uh, this is not good medicine even if uh, it hits its primary outcome measure. We have to be more discerning. We have to be more careful. We have to be more considerate of what we're, of the uh, final outcome that we really need to produce. It's very important. So the point being that in spite of the many, many scientists that I met at the various conferences, not just that year, but many years thereafter, uh, it's, it's like dog eat dog. Everybody's looking for funding. Everybody's looking to support their families. Everybody is looking for uh, power. Um, egoistic satiation. Everybody is looking for everything but what's important. Everything but the truth. Ultimate control of natural processes to the point where um, there's a positive outcome without all these negative side effects. That's what we need. Uh, an open mind. Comprehending the, the positivity of bioelectromagnetics and how we have to proceed in that scientific arena. 
the utilization of natural methods, very weak magnetic fields to renormalize the magnetic profiles of tissue. Because the fact of the matter is all biological systems are just um, condensations of electromagnetic field. That's all we are. So ultimately we're made up of electric charges, fundamental electric charges that are moving incessantly, um, carrying with them magnetic profiles. Just think about the atoms that make us up, little spinning magnets and the particles that make up atoms, electrons, protons, permanent little spinning magnets with angular momenta and magnetic moments. So we've got to understand and appreciate the future, the future of physics as it relates to living systems as well as non-living systems. But the point that's most important is to understand that when you meet somebody and you need to understand who they are, you have to feel who they are. You have to judge them according to their spirit, their heart. That's the best way to judge a person, not according to their rationale or their sequence of reasoning. Uh, that isn't the way to judge anybody. That's what I learned through my, through my years of meeting thousands of scientists, as well as artists and musicians, and writers and so many different people. But one thinks about scientists as truth seekers. Not as uh, egomaniacs or um, businessmen or power mongers. But uh, interestingly, according to my patent examiner, uh, and my fusion patent, uh, what I found was that uh, lobbyists have convinced federal court to set it up so that patent examiners cannot allow patents that are not uh, demonstrable by objective third parties. And there are many people, particularly individual investors, who want to make sure that they have a patent before they spend millions of dollars on research. So there's a catch 22. But the lobbyists know this and they want to guarantee a monopolization of money coming from the government and power companies in order to promulgate plasma physics research as is being done now, in spite of the fact that they've been unsuccessful. So, you know, the flow of money and power still regulates everything that goes on in the world. It's not just America. It's everywhere. Absolutely everywhere. Because man is still a primitive animal. I should say human beings are still primitive animals. It's not gender specific. So... Let's... Uh, Let's pray that there's a shift in consciousness that's positive to protect generations to come because that's absolutely necessary. Because if, if things are maintained as they have been, um, humankind won't make it. There has to be a, a shift, in, a collective shift in consciousness throughout the world, a simultaneous shift in order for humankind 
to succeed as a species. Certainly this could happen and should happen. I, I would say that it must happen. Let's just keep the faith. My little clarinet.
Okay. I'll see you later, Billy. Thank you.